going to be talking about how to strengthen your faith this morning. The story that we just read, of course, uh, really speaks to me just simply because uh, of the military aspects that are there. So I, I've got to tell you an Army story here real quick. Uh, I, you know, folks, I, I hope I don't become like my grandfather. He fought in World War II in Germany, and uh, every time I visited, uh, once I had joined the Army, it was always an Army story uh, that I heard. Uh, so I, I hope not to become that way, but I think it's correct this morning. You see, back in, oh my goodness, 1992, I know, there, there's just a couple of folks that are here this morning that weren't alive back then, right? Mm -hmm, I know. In 1992, uh, I went to the Army Parachutist School. Can you believe the Army actually paid me extra money to jump out of airplanes into hostile territory in the dark of night. <laughs> but I went to the Army Parachute School in 1992, and, and the first week while you're there, everything that you're doing is off of a four-foot platform. The problem is you're, you're wearing all kinds of equipment, and you're jumping off this four-foot platform, and they're teaching you how to hit and shift, and somebody knows what I'm talking about, and, and roll on the ground. And, and what happens is you end up, because of all this equipment, getting bruises on top of your bruises. And so by the end of the day, they had me living on the third floor of a building that had extremely tall ceilings. That means the staircases were very long. And I had trouble getting up the staircases at the end of the day. It was worse the next morning when you started trying to come down because the legs just did not want to work coming down the staircase. But I managed that first week, got through all that low platform work, and the second week, we got to go to the towers. We went, the first tower we went to was 34 feet tall. And it was, was built kind of a little bit like an airplane. And you would go up and get all hooked up and stand in this doorway. And when they told you to, you would jump out and go down this really great zip line. You know, to the other end. Then they'd unhook you and you'd go back and do it again. Well, as, as I was looking at that 34-foot tower, I thought, that's odd. Why 34 feet? So I turned to the sergeant who was training us. I said, Sergeant, why 34 feet? Why not 30 or 40 and she said, it's the minimum height for the maximum scare, chaplain. <laughs> okay, minimum height, maximum scare. And, and what I learned later was that it was just simply, there was something about depth perception that if you were at 35 feet or even 40 feet, you wouldn't be any scareder than you were at 34. But if things went wrong, you wouldn't get near as injured at 34. So uh, I'm looking at the tower, and I'm thinking, no big deal. You know, by this time in my life, I had rappelled down, down mountainsides and off helicopter skids. No big deal. I had hang glided on Kill Devil Hills in North Carolina. 34 feet, no big deal. I had watched soldiers jumping out of that tower and sliding down. No big deal. Matter of fact, I had gone out with my soldiers that I were, was assigned to prior to going to jump school, and I watched them practice up, getting ready to go up on an airborne operation. I had been on the drop zone when they all came out of the airplane. It, by the way, it looks like a guppy going across the top of your fish tank having babies. Okay, that's what it looks like when you watch these airplanes go over and these, these jumpers come out. So I had watched that take place. I had even been up in the airplane with them and watched them go out the door and just disappear. So no big deal, 34 feet. Got up in the tower. It was my turn. They got me all hooked up. I got in the door. I was ready. No big deal. I'm looking at the horizon just like I had been taught to do. I'm ready. And then the sergeant down on the ground asked me a question. And I answered the question. It was just military rhetoric, no big deal. But the problem was, I looked down. 34 feet, minimum height, maximum scare. And then the sergeant behind me said, green light, go! And my head said, go, and my legs said, wait a minute. 
And the sergeant was very polite. He assisted me out the door. <laughs> and I came out the door, and, and what you're supposed to do is when you come out the door, you've got a nice tight body position. Your hands are right here on a reserve parachute that you know you're not going to use because you're hooked up to the cable. You know. and, and, and you come out and you swing like that. Well, I, I came out the door with a little bit of assistance like, Wow! <laughs> and I went sliding down the zip line. They unhooked me, and I'm just kind of hanging there. What did I do, you know? And, and, and they unhooked me, and I started walking back up this long zip line, knowing I've got to do this again, because you've got to have three good exits out that door before they'll check, check you off. And I'm asking myself, why did I hesitate? I don't understand. And I thought through the, the repelling and the hang gliding and all these things I had done, and, and even the tree as a little boy that I had climbed that was taller than 34 feet and I didn't understand at first but then I got it you see when I repel repel I got the rope here and here and sometimes if you do it the other way you got it here you got the rope in your hand I've got it when I hang glide I've got the glider in my hand, I've got it. I am the master of my own fate, so to speak, if any of you hang glide. Okay? When I climb the tree as a little boy, I've got it. Except for when you jump from one limb to another. But even then, I got it. Okay? When I was up in that tower and I got all hooked up, I didn't have anything. I had to trust. I had to believe. I had to have faith that it had me so that when I jumped out I would only go so far down and it had me it would keep me I had to have faith that it would do what it was designed to do hmm this morning we're talking about a centurion who was a military man it's interesting that uh, that he is a man of authority but what he is also is a man under authority. You see, a centurion would have had a hundred soldiers that he was responsible for. But in the military, somebody is always in charge of everybody. And so the centurion had to answer to another officer who answered to another officer. There were just layers of authority. So this centurion was both a man of authority and under authority authority and he understood Jesus was an authority and that Jesus had authority over certain things and, and of course he may not have realized Jesus had authority over everything but he knew he had authority over what he was asking him to do Lord heal my servant and so he humbly asked Jesus to do so and it's all about the Jewish culture and Gentile and that kind of thing he, he, he had some in with some Jewish folks and that, that, that he had done nice things for and so he asked them to go to this Jewish rabbi and ask that the healing take place he didn't approach him himself well I'm a centurion I'm a Roman soldier I'm a man under, of authority no would you go to him and ask for me? He understood that. And he was a man of faith in that he sent word back saying, you don't have to come. I know you just say the word. I have faith that it will be done. This morning, let's talk about what is faith. I got a multiple choice answer for you. So you, you folks, don't you love multiple choice questions? You know, you know the right answer is there somewhere. You just got to figure out which one it is. So, so look at these options and figure out what you think faith is. Is it trust, belief, confidence, loyalty? Is it both A and C or both B and E or is it all of the above? Do you have that figured out? Maybe I'll answer it for you later. Okay, let's go on and talk about what is faith. The definition is that it's complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 
gives us an insight into what God believes faith is. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We're fixing to dissect uh, that verse just a little bit. Let's talk the common word, of course, that we see there between the definition and the scriptural definition is the word confidence. But there's other words, trust, hope, assurance. They all come into play. When I read this verse out of Hebrews, a couple of things jump out at me. Number one is, what is it that we hope for? When we talk about our, our religious faith, when we talk about Christianity, when we talk about our relationship with God, what is it that we hope for? Well, of course, we hope that God is trustworthy and that he's going to provide salvation for us from sin, but also that he's going to give us eternal life. These are things, the biggies, that we hope for from God. There are some immediate things, though. We hope that he's going to give us protection and provision and blessings. What was that verse? We know that those who trust him will not be put to shame. And we hold on to that, don't we? We hold on to that. And so these are part of the things that we hope for. These are some elements of our faith. But, but what about what we do not see? We have confidence and assurance about what we do not see. Number one, any of you, any of you, have any of you folks seen God lately? Me either. Me either. But we, we believe, don't we? We have faith that he exists. So God is one of the things that we do not see. We don't see Jesus interceding for us, and yet the Scripture tells us that that's what he's doing at the right hand of God. We don't see that. We might feel it. We know it, but we don't see it. What about the Holy Spirit's presence? We, we can feel it. We can see the results of it in ourselves and in other people, but I haven't seen the Holy Spirit lately. Well, ever. But it's things that we have confidence about and assurance and that we trust. It's interesting in the book of Hebrews that the writer goes on from here and talks about creation. We have faith about creation, that God did it. Even though we weren't present, we don't see his hand doing it, though we may believe that we see his hand in it, which the scripture does tell us. Let's talk about what faith is let's talk about faith itself Hebrews chapter 11 this is the continuation of what I was just reading this is what the ancients were commended for by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible uh, folks when we start dealing with science and creation I'm not going to tell you how God made it except that he made it with his spoken word or the timetable that he made it, but I'm going to tell you that God did it and it wasn't by chance, but it was purposeful and we, his sons and daughters, are the pinnacle of his purposeful creation. So we know by faith that God did this. We are created by the Creator for a purpose. Hebrews chapter 10 says, By my righteous one, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one that shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Here's you something to take home this morning. Don't be a shrinker. Okay? When it comes to matters of faith, don't be a shrinker. Y'all can say that to each other over the, the dinner table today and, and later on when one of you starts kind of waffling on something, just, just look at your partner and say, don't be a shrinker. Put a southern twang on it and it sounds even better. Okay? Galatians chapter 5 tells us about faith. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
forbearance. I wanted to say patience. That's the way I memorized it. <laughs> Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no faith. Now, faithfulness is a similar but different word from faith, isn't it? Faithfulness gives you the picture of, of, of not just something you have, but of something you do. Faithfulness. And it's a fruit of the Spirit, which means we are all to have it. And it may start out this big, but it's supposed to grow just like any other fruit plant. And it is supposed to ripen to maturity and our faithfulness while it starts here grows and so there's something more to faith than just simply something that I have it is also something that I do matter of fact James chapter 2 that, that there's a nice long passage there that speaks of faith but it comes down to this faith without works is dead it's rotten fruit folks it's dead it's no good faith without works is dead when we go to verse 24 of that passage it says you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone uh, folks don't, don't misunderstand. We are not saved by works. David Cooper would never preach that. David Cooper would preach that works follow faith. That works are a result of salvation. We are saved and therefore we step out for God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him, who earnestly seek him. Two words there I want you to pick up on, believe and seek. Folks, we're talking some action on our part. God gives faith, yes, God plants the seed of faith. That's the fruit of the Spirit. God plants faith in each one of us. Then what do we do with it? Becomes the question. Okay, I'm going to give you a definition of faith. For those of you who do that multiple choice thing earlier, faith is trust, belief, confidence, and our loyalty that prompts one to action. even when it doesn't make sense. That's an important part that prompts us to do something. We can't be people of faith and sit on our laurels. We can't be people of faith who receive salvation that cost our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross and say, well, I got faith. I don't need to do anything else now. The cross, the agony, what it cost him prompts us to action, prompts us to do something prompts us to give our whole selves to Him. Not just our Sunday mornings. Now, now folks, i got to tell you, you are fantastic. Sandy and I have been so impressed by the faithfulness of so many of the people in this congregation. So that we, we see you coming and going all through the week and doing things and, and, and some of we, we just start hearing about the things that you're doing that, that aren't always here in the church and, it, and it's good stuff and your faithfulness is wonderful and so what I'm saying some of, don't, don't say wait a minute I'm already here five nights a week that's not what I'm saying Okay, that's not what I'm saying. But there are some. There are some who compartmentalize their Christianity to when they're at church. 
and not when they're out walking in their neighborhood or at their desk at work or behind the cash register at work or at their desk at school. There are some that compartmentalize it. And I just got to tell you that that's not a sold-out Christian. I'm fixing to meddle a little bit, okay? And I'm fixing to step on some toes. And, and, and that's okay, all right? Y'all, y'all just, I want to tell you, if you are not tithing, you are not a sold-out Christian. You have not given your all to the Lord. You have given some and you have held some back. If you are not... Now, now folks, I need you to understand. I'm going to give you a definition about what you give to the church. And I'll tell you, you either give a token, a tithe, or an offering. Is what you do. If you give 10% of your first fruits, oh no... That's before taxes. If you give 10%, you are tithing. If you give more than that, you are giving an offering. And if you're giving less than that, you're just giving God a token. And I meant to say that with some venom in my voice. I'm going to go just a little bit farther with that. Now, y'all hear me. The tithe is to come into the storehouse. This is the storehouse. The TV preacher is not the storehouse. The radio personality is not the storehouse. That is your opportunity to move into offering, if you would like to do that. This is the storehouse. This is the place for your tithe. Otherwise, according to the prophet of the Old Testament, you are robbing God. And according to Reverend David E. Cooper, you are not a sold-out Christian. Partially. Christian? Yeah, maybe. But not sold out. You haven't given 100% of yourself, of your life, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You don't have the faith. If I do this, Lord, you have promised to open the windows of heaven and to provide for me. That's not why I do it. But that's what you've said, Lord, and I believe what you've said. You've said you're going to provide eternity and forgiveness of sins. You've said that, Lord, and I believe you for those big things, but I know you won't take care of my finances. If I'm faithful, like you've said, I don't have the trust, I don't have the belief, I don't have the confidence or the loyalty to you to give you what you have said I am to do. And so I have meddled and I have stepped on toes. That's okay. That's what I'm here for. Let's talk about how to build your strength so you can do that. Okay, number one, you ask the Lord. When you find that you have a lack of faith, you ask God for more. Lord, give me faith. Give me strength. Do you remember the story in the New Testament of the, the father who brought his son to Jesus for healing? And Jesus said that, you know, if you believe, the healing will take place. And the father said, I believe, but maybe not enough. Help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. So that's a lesson to us. If we don't quite have the faith to do what it is that the Scripture is telling us to do or we feel the Holy Spirit prompting us to do, we're to turn to God and say, Lord, give me more. Help me to do this. And we are to pray in faith. Lord, I'm going to step out. I'm going to do this. You build my faith. I want to give you a mathematical equation just because we got an engineer in here. You got to have a mathematical equation, right? Paul, you got this? F plus P equals IF. That's not if, folks. Okay? That's not if, though that's interesting the way that works out. 
Faith plus prayer equals increased faith. You know why? Because we see the answers take place before our eyes. Have you ever seen an answer to prayer? Somebody that you've prayed for, have you seen God work in their life to, to absolutely answer your prayer? Sure we have. If you've lived and prayed more than two or three times, you've seen that. Okay? And, and, and we come away from that saying, golly, God answered my prayer on that. Maybe he'll answer my prayer on this and on that, on this really big thing. We don't have to say, if God, we can have increased faith and know that he acts on our part. So we ask, we pray in faith, and we listen to the right stuff. Now again, the preacher's meddling a little bit, okay? Romans chapter 10, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. What are you listening to Monday through Saturday? Sunday morning, you're listening to me. Thank you. Okay? I think that's going to help build your faith. But what about Monday through Saturday? Now, don't get me wrong. I like to watch Blue Bloods on Friday night. Okay? My brother was a policeman. It's, it, it's kind of in the family. I just, you know, so I'm not saying no secular radio or TV, but I'm just telling you there's a lot of Christian radio stations out there. Here's a whole list of them in the Baltimore area. Here's a couple of Christian television stations that I know have good programming that you can catch. Matter of fact, here's my favorite radio station, Shine FM. 95.1. When you, when you walk back out of here today, I want you to go check and see what your radio buttons are set on. What are you listening to? Is it something that increases your faith or not? By the way, Alan, I got one for you too, okay? 13.30 a.m., Harv de Grace. Okay, right up your, your neighborhood, okay? You can do that one too. So we ask, we pray, we listen to the right stuff to build our faith, and then we need to hang with the right folks. Okay, does that sound Southern? Yes, I am. Okay, yes, I am. Hebrews chapter 10 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. We can only do that if we're hanging with the right folks. So just a question, the folks that you were with Friday night and Saturday night, are they people that help build your faith or help tear you down? What changes do you need to make? I'll leave that to you. We also need to study the stories of the faithful. When we go to the book of Hebrews, once again, chapter 11, it starts with, this is what the ancients were commended for. And it talks about faith, 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 faith. And it names names like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, ladies. Sarah and Rahab are on that list also. These were people of faith. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith faith Noah did this by faith Rahab saved the spies and so we need to be hanging with the right folks and we need to be studying the stories of the faithful guidepost it's not scripture but it's wonderful to do that to give us those stories of how God acts in people's life. And i got to tell you that those are not odd people. Those are ordinary people. Oh, like me. My wife tells me I'm not ordinary all the time. She says, you're weird. Uh, but anyway, we also need to weather the testing that is going to come to the faithful. i just got to tell you, when, when, when your faith grows... So does the bullseye that Satan takes a shot at. You start off with faith like this, Satan doesn't have much of a target. But as your faith grows, you become more of a target for Satan. Okay, so just, just know that. 
James chapter 1 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That is growth, folks. We go through trials, and, and, and sometimes we learn from our mistakes. We don't go through the trial in a very good way, but if we turn back to the Lord in that situation, we grow. If we go through the trial correctly, we grow. So trials, as long as we turn our face toward our Lord, they are issues of growth, whether you do it well or not. It's the turning to the Lord in the midst of it and at the end of it that grows our faith and I've got seven of them so one more humble yourself under God's mighty hand the centurion was a man of authority but also a man under authority and he recognized Jesus's authority I want to look at Luke and this I, I, I want to read this to you Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 18, because this is the teaching of Jesus our Lord. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. That's pretty plain, fits right in with our topic for the morning, doesn't it? So the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose, see, most of us stop right there. And there is a period, but there's more that follows. It's not a different setting. It's in response to this question and this teaching that Jesus says, suppose one of you had a servant plowing and looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare your supper, pre I'm sorry, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Did y'all see that last thing I went through? Did y'all see how faithful I was? No, that's not what we do. Lord, do you see what a great servant I am for you? No, that's not what we do. Lord, have mercy on me, your sinning servant. That's what we do. We are people of faith under a God who has absolute authority. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. We don't humble ourselves because he's going to lift us up. We humble ourselves because he is God Almighty. And then we have faith in what the scripture is teaching that he will lift us up. That he will see us through that difficulty. That he will hear our prayers. That he will increase our faith. Because he is God and we are not. And so, how is it that we strengthen our faith? Y'all, come on, one more. Y'all read these as they come up. No, nope. go forward. You know, mine's not, there it is. Read these. Ask, pray in faith, listen to the right stuff, 
hang with the right folks, study the stories of the faithful, weather the testing that comes, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. The centurion did. The centurion was humble, even though he was such a leader of men, a commander in the military, yet he recognized Jesus' authority. Do we recognize Jesus' authority in our life? His authority to claim our minutes and our hours and our days. His authority to claim our checkbook. His authority to claim our marriages and our families. His authority over everything. And do we believe what he has told us he will do when we submit all that we have to him? I've got to tell you, folks, everything I read in Scripture that he promises in response to our submission is good stuff. I don't read anything in the Scriptures that, when, that, that, that say if you submit to the authority of the Lord, he's going to pound you down. He's going to ignore your requests. He's not going to watch over your children and your grandchildren. I don't find anything in Scripture that says that. Everything I find is the exact opposite. So are we people of faith? Are we willing to submit all that we have and all that we are under God's authority? Are we willing to step out on our faith and do what he has commanded us to do. You see, he's a God of authority. He doesn't just ask us to do things. It is his to command and ours to do in faith, with joy, because we know the results. Wednesday night, when we met for Ash Wednesday, for me, it's real hard to get real sad during Lent. Y'all know that? Because I know about Easter. I know. And so when I think about the things that God asks me to do and commands me to do, it's real hard for me to hold it back because everything I read says what he's going to do on the other end. Woohoo! Faithfulness, it's a good thing. So let us grow in our faith by living our life according to God's commands, under his authority. It's a good place to be. Heavenly Father, take these words, the teaching of our Holy Scripture, make it real in our lives, use it to make us and to help us be blessings to all that we come in contact with. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.